The release of FNAF's 10th anniversary game, Into the Pit, earlier this August was insane, and gave us some pretty groundbreaking information about the franchise that I feel like not many people have used since then, and that might completely change our idea of the FNAF timeline. Today, I'll be using this evidence to finally answer all of your Into the Pit lore questions, including its canonicity to the games, whether it makes the books canon or not, as well as why Foxy is completely missing, who actually created Pit Bonnie, and more. So get ready theorists, remember that it's all just a theory, and let's jump right into the pit, because today we'll be discovering the secrets of the ball pit. Real quick, I've got a special announcement to make. I'll be streaming myself playing Into the Pit's hardest difficulties this Sunday at around 3pm Eastern Standard Time, so if you want a chance at appearing in an upcoming secret project, or just want to hang out with me and some other theorists, make sure not to miss that stream. Just subscribe with notifications on to be notified when it happens. It's totally free, and you can always undo it later if you change your mind. With that out of the way, let's actually jump into the pit. Before we start theorizing about this game, I think it's worthwhile for me to give a quick recap of the game's events and endings, as well as some quick thoughts on them. Light spoiler warning from here on out, so be careful. We play as Oswald, a kid who lives in a rundown little town of his parents who can't move out because they need to take care of his grandma. Every day for the entire summer, Oswald goes to Jeff's Pizza over and over again and just hangs out there for the whole day. However, he eventually decides to explore a closed door in the pizzeria, which leads him to finding an extremely old ball pit. After jumping in, he goes out to find that Jeff's Pizza isn't Jeff's Pizza anymore. He's now in a flashy, highly crowded location with weird animatronic animals performing on a stage. This place is tons of fun, and Oswald plays arcade games, tag and hide and seek with the other kids, until he hides in an old threadbare suit hidden in a storage room. While he's hiding, he sees Pit Bonnie for the first time, and when he comes out of the suit, he literally sees the victims of the missing children incident dead right in front of him. Pretty insane. He runs out of Freddy's through the ball pit and is scolded by his dad in the present, until Pit Bonnie jumps out, pulls Oswald's dad under and transforms into him, even though Oswald is the only one who can see the transformation. The game goes on for the next 5 nights as Oswald continues going back to the time traveling ball pit and attempting to find his real dad. He eventually does and this is where the multiple important endings step in. If you play the game normally without collecting any of your dad's hidden belongings, which I'll talk about later, you're kidnapped by Pit Bonnie and presumably killed after saving your dad. If you really suck at the game and fail the very last click time event, you appear in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza in a really confusing ending, where as you approach the empty pirate's cove, your eyes start to glow and everything goes dark. If you collect the aforementioned items and save your dad, you get a 2 star ending, which, while presumably a happy one, ends up getting my boy Michael up. I mean... Jeff killed, which automatically makes this the worst ending. And finally, if you do literally everything there is to do in the game, you unlock the 3 star good ending, where Jeff's Pizza becomes an extremely popular establishment and everyone lives happily ever after. So now that we've gone over the basics of the game, before we tackle any of the major lore implications from these endings, I want to explain the canonicity of Into the Pit to the games and what canon actually means in the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise, cause it's pretty weird. Scott Coffin has gone on record to say that every single piece of media made for Five Nights at Freddy's, apart from merch of course, like the novella collections, the movie, and the novels, are canon to the franchise. But his interpretation of canon is different from what many people think. According to Wikipedia, since the Oxford Dictionary's definition of canon is a bit misleading, the canon of a work of fiction is the body of works taking place in a particular fictional world that are widely considered to be official or authoritative, especially those created by the original author or developer of said world. However, the movie and novels are very obviously not in the game's continuity, so while every FNAF book in a FNAF game is canon, not every book or game is canon to the main timeline. For example, FNAF 1 is definitely canon to the game's timeline, while 5 Laps at Freddy's is almost definitely not. Just like how Fazbear Frights is most likely canon to the games, while the FNAF movie novel isn't. More on Fazbear Frights later on. So, the use of the word canon in the FNAF franchise is kind of different, and we need to bear that in mind when we discuss the canonicity of a certain piece of FNAF media. The main timeline of FNAF is told throughout the mainline games, with things like the novels and movies serving as spin offs in addition to the franchise that are not in continuity. But now that we're familiar with the meaning of canon in Five Nights at Freddy's, let's talk about the Orville Elephant in the Room, Into the Pit's canonicity to the main timeline, or the game's timeline. While this question might seem a bit stupid to some of you, the canonicity of Into the Pit to the main game's timeline is actually a pretty major subject for debate in the community right now, and the major reason for that is because the entire game is quite literally an adaptation of a Fazbear Fright story of the same name that ties into the Fright's overarching narrative known as the Sitch 
military stingers. However, I believe this game is the wake up call we all needed, because now I believe that most of what we got during the FNAF anniversary week was pointing us to a very obvious conclusion, that the events of both Tales from the Pizzaplex and Fazbear Frights happen in the game's timeline, just not in the way you'd think. You see, one of the main reasons some people didn't like these two book series being in the games was because of the blatant inconsistencies they could have of the main timeline, likely due to miscommunication of Scott and the writers. For example, dates could get messed up, characters could be described in a completely inaccurate way, and so on. This is particularly the case in the Tales from the Pizzaplex. Another reason is that some of these stories, mainly in Fazbear Frights, were just really weird and didn't match too well with what we knew about the games back then. A pretty good example of such a division between the books and games is, funnily enough, Into the Pit itself, which shows Pit Bonnie murdering six kids instead of five like in all other MCI media, which was a really important detail that just didn't match up. Until now. You see, in one of the Into the Pit minigames, Collect the Hats, you play as Balloon Boy collecting five different party hats. This seems innocent and simple enough, but if you collect all five of them and go to a specific wall, you can find none other than Purple Guy standing above you, dangling a six party hat in his hand. Now, it becomes extremely obvious that these hats represent the missing children incident. Before Into the Pit the game came out, I was convinced that the six victim the books were always mentioning was Charlotte Emily being grouped in with the MCI as she commonly is, but now I'm not so sure. I believe this game is very heavily implying this isn't a separate victim being grouped in with the rest, but rather a six unreported missing kid. Now, this can go two ways. You can say that this is a secret victim like Andrew, or continue with the idea that this is Charlie, maybe adapting the timeline so that Charlie dies right before or right after the MCI victims. I'm personally not sure which one I like the most, so I'll probably make another video or a short on that eventually. Remember how I brought up that the events of the books occur in the games? Well, just because I said the events of the books do, that doesn't mean the books themselves are 100% canon. I present to you the theory that I believe to be the case that me and some other FNAF theorists believe to be the truth about the books. Fright's Reboot and Tales Reboot. I'll be focusing on Fright's Reboot since that's what's important for today's discussion, but essentially the reboot theory is posited that while the events we see in the books do happen in the games in a way, the game's version of them are altered to match the timeline better. For example, one of the mini games you can find in Into the Pit is very clearly a recreation of the Fazbear Fright story, Count the Ways, where a girl called Millie is lured into a strange Funtime Freddy-like animatronic stomach hatch and ends up dying. In the recreated minigame, the Funtime Freddy animatronic has a bonbon hand puppet and is just generally way smaller. The story itself never mentions the hand puppet, implying that the game's version of Count the Ways has the actual Funtime Freddy animatronic as the antagonist, and not a variant of the animatronic. Additionally, Into the Bed also has a minigame based on Fetch, but it's slightly different from the story. In the story, Greg, the main character, has his animatronic dog Fetch perform several tasks for him, with the animatronic becoming more aggressive until it kills Greg's crush, and that's where the story ends. However, in the minigame, Fetch just outright kills Greg by mauling him to death at an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, which is something we never see in Fazbear Frights. Yet again, the story is being adapted for the games for some reason, likely for the Fetch game Scott mentioned in his newest interview with Docco. I'd really like them to start working on Fetch. I think Fetch would make a really good game. So while I do think Into the Pit is in the game's continuity since it's quite literally the 10th anniversary game, I'm sure that might change a lot as time goes on. I do believe Frights and Tales being rebooted is the right way to go with this franchise now that both series are over, just so we can close the endless book debate and start focusing on actually piecing what we have together. To add to this, on night 2, if you look out the window in Oswald's room, you can see what is almost definitely the Stitch Ray standing outside, which lends more credence to the idea that this game is tying into the rest of the Frights storyline and thus the Frights reboot. Now that we're done with all the canonicity talk, I want to discuss what most of you are probably actually here for, the lore we learn in Into the Pit and my personal theories on the game. First off, I want to start with arguably the most important aspect of the game's story, the mystery behind Pit Bonnie and the Ball Pit. I think I might have the answer to what created the Ball Pit and Bonnie, the combination of the agony created from the missing children incident with the one from William Afton's Springlock failure. Let me explain. In Into the Pit, one of the items you can interact with is an old phone you can type different phone numbers into, and one of those numbers, 777-4648, which spells out Spring T, allows you to hear what is almost definitely William Afton's Springlock failure.
The audio is pretty intense, but there is more to it than just that. The sounds Pit Bonnie makes are really weird and sound like distorted screams, crying, raspy breathing, and so on. These are all things mentioned by William when he describes what a Springlock failure is like in the Silver Eyes. So I think the combined agony of the missing children in Afton is what allowed for the ball pit to be imbued with enough negative soul energy to create this weird memory Oswald gets trapped in in the game and book, since all iterations of the Into the Pit story make it pretty clear that the ball pit can't actually time travel. As well as that, you get a picture of William Afton and Henry Emily after getting all of your dad's belongings at the end of the game, and this picture is what gets Pit Bonnie distracted at the end, giving you just enough time to get away with your dad, further strengthening the connection between Pit Bonnie and Afton. I like this interpretation of Pit Bonnie's origin since I think it explains why he acts so violent, as well as explaining the weird nature of the ball pit. But now, I have one more little theory I've made about the game left to cover, and that is why Foxy's missing from Into the Pit. For those of you who don't know, Foxy is completely absent from Into the Pit, with multiple references to this fact, although there is one ending that I mentioned earlier that might explain what happened to him. In the terrible ending where you fail the last quick time event, Oswald is led to Pirate's Cove by the suddenly friendly animatronics, and his eyes only start glowing when he gets there, heavily implying Oswald is the one who possesses Foxy. In the game files, there is also an unused asset of Foxy peeking out from behind the Pirate's Cove curtain, further suggesting that he wasn't active in the game as an antagonist because he wasn't possessed. Now, I don't think this ending is canon, since it's barely an ending, it doesn't even lead you to the credits, but instead shows you the good old game over screen. But I think it might show us that Foxy was the last to be possessed. Foxy Go 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 is a great example of this, since Foxy literally sees the five missing kids in this mini game when he's pretty clearly not possessed by any of them. So what's going on? Well, something that I've always thought a lot about ever since becoming a theorist is a seemingly insignificant detail that I think is really annoying. Unlike the other members of the Freddy band, Foxy is too thin to stuff a kid into, like he doesn't have that big stomach or wide build. So what if instead of having someone stuffed into him like the others, he instead came in contact with the wandering spirit of his respective kid, similar to what happened to Charlie and the puppet? Now, I know what you might be thinking, don't the FNAF 1 newspapers mention all of the mascots having blood and mucus around their eyes? Well, remember how I mentioned that Foxy's nowhere to be seen in Into the Pit, and is explicitly said to be out of order in like every single piece of FNAF media? I think that's important, because no one would have seen Foxy around the time of the MCI, so the animal mascots the concerned parents are talking about in the newspaper clippings are Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica, or the Freddy Fazbear Band. So with that, those are my thoughts, at least for now, on FNAF Into the Pit. I'll probably be making more theories on this game in the future since I really like it, but for now this is the main stuff I wanted to say. Thanks for watching, and remember to check out the stream this Sunday, it should be pretty fun. With that, friends, remember, keep on theorizing and never stop overthinking. This has been Withered Circle, the Midnight Theorist.